This video is sponsored by Hearts of Iron 4, Arms Against Tyranny. Check it out via the link in the description. Also, this video is part two in a two-part series. You can watch part one by clicking the link on the top right of your screen. Finnish success on the Mannerheim line was a tremendous accomplishment, but the parts of the Winter War that really captured the imagination all happened far to the north of it. That's where truly exotic formations like ski troopers, reindeer pulled logistic sleds, and elite woodsman snipers like Simo Heha, the White Death, were most prevalent. And, of course, where the famous Moti encirclements took place. The Finnish word moti refers to a pile of logs or timber held in place by stakes so it can be chopped or sawn into firewood. It's a great analogy for an enemy column cut up into multiple smaller encirclements before liquidation. But, like another famous term from the era, Blitzkrieg, the name is an anachronism. The Finns had no specific doctrine for creating motis. Those that did form were often an accident, and frequently did the Finns more harm than good. The goal of the Finnish defenses was to break Soviet formations so they would flee back across the border. All that the Modis did was trap the Russians inside of Finland. Each Modi would either have to be patrolled, taking precious troops away from the front, or be liquidated through costly attacks, attacks that the Finns could not afford. Some Modis even survived until the end of the war, thanks to aerial resupply and the remarkable ability of Russian troops to fight on the most minimal rations. However, some of the Modis would turn out well for the Finns, especially around Sumo Salmi, where Modi tactics were used to destroy the Soviet 44th and 163rd Rifle Divisions. The far north of Finland, like every other front, saw massive commitments of Soviet troops. But here, the infrastructure actually was too poor to support the invaders. The most significant Soviet victory was the capture of Petsamo, Finland's only port into the Arctic, and a nearby high-grade nickel mine. But the Finns expected to lose them anyway, so only put up token resistance before retreating, scorching the earth behind them. The Russians could have been happy with this victory, but instead, they chose to push deeper into Finland. By December, this near-polar region entered a state of continuous darkness. The Finns felt right at home in this extreme environment, harassing the Soviets with snipers, many of whom were locals with a lifetime of hunting experience in the area. The further the Russians advanced, the worse things got for them. By January, with temperatures as low as minus 35 degrees Celsius, Russian offensive operations in the far north were halted, and the soldiers hunkered down in whatever shelters they could find. The Finns did not totally restrict themselves to defensive operations for the Winter War. Elite ski units were sent across the border to perform operations that remain classified to this day, though their most likely objective was to sabotage the Romansk Railroad. Now, Finland was not alone in its war against the Soviets. Nations across the world sent large amounts of material and volunteer aid to Finland, which you can experience for yourself with today's sponsor, Hearts of Iron 4's newest expansion, Arms Against Tyranny, which is out right now. Links in the description. In part one, I told you about what Arms Against Tyranny adds to Finland, so let's talk about the other nations featured in the expansion. Historically, Denmark and Norway were both rapidly conquered by the Axis in 1940, but it doesn't have to end that way with you in control. Both nations begin the game with weak militaries, small industrial bases, and quickly radicalizing populations. You can fight to make the historical route work, by upholding democracy and resisting the German invasion, or give in to the radicals to pursue a new future for your nation, casting your lot in with the Germans, Soviets, or even going alone. Sweden is also prominently featured in the expansion. Historically, the Swedes remain neutral, but with the largest population, most natural resources, and greatest industrial base in the region, Sweden can become a great power in the right hands. So prepare your armies and industry, choose a side, and turn the tide of the Second World War. Or just follow history by sitting back, relaxing, and becoming the ANCAP warlord of your dreams by selling weapons to all sides of the conflict, using Arms Against Tyranny's brand new international weapons market. Oh, and there's even a cute little focus tree for Iceland. Just look at that population. Man, you can almost make a division out of that. Arms Against Tyranny is out right now, so pick it up via the link in the description. Doing so is also a great way to thank Paradox for supporting this channel.
And now, back to the video. The Soviet invasion of Finland sparked immediate condemnation from the international community and inspired mass foreign support for Finland. Even Germany, in spite of their non-aggression pact, tried to help the Finns until their efforts were discovered. Europe's other great right-wing dictatorship, however, was under no such restrictions. The Italian state and people threw themselves into the Finnish camp. At one point, the Finnish ambassador was paraded through the streets on the shoulders of black shirts as the Russian embassy was pelted with rocks. This was alongside considerable material aid, including 17 Fiat bombers and 150 volunteers. Assistance from Italy and other nations would soon grow the once small and obsolete Finnish air force into a modern armada of over 200 aircraft. Other nations sending aid included the United States, Hungary, Belgium, France, and South Africa. But Finland's most effective supporters were its fellow Nordic nations, Denmark, Norway, and especially Sweden. Of Finland's 11,500 foreign volunteers, 8,000 came from Sweden. While this aid was impressive, a lot of it had less of an impact than you would expect. Most of it was coming from distant countries, and the Finnish merchant fleet was too small to efficiently transport all of it, meaning most would only arrive after the war had ended. However, the Winter War wasn't just a moral issue. To some nations, it presented a geopolitical opportunity. World War II was still ongoing, so the Allies, at this point mostly just Britain and France, presented Finland with a unique offer. Their German enemy was highly reliant on raw materials imported from Sweden. The Allies wanted to use the Finns as an excuse to land troops in Scandinavia and stop those shipments. The Finns were supposed to do this by issuing a public call for help against the Soviet invasion. The idea being that this would convince the pro-Finnish Norwegians and Swedes to allow Allied troops through their territory to defend their darling Finland. There were only two problems. The first is that as sympathetic as Norway and Sweden were to Finland, there was no way they were going to sacrifice their neutrality for it. And second, no part of the Allied plan actually involved helping Finland. As a sweetener, the Finns were offered a few brigades, but that was nothing compared to the whole divisions earmarked for the rest of the region. Because of the plan's absurdity, the Finns would only consider it if they were truly desperate. And given their sterling performance so far, how likely was it really to come to that? Back in the Soviet Union, the Russians were getting serious. Before the war began, many military leaders criticized the invasion plan, but were ignored. Now that they were proven right, those critics were put in charge of the war effort, and allowed to run it their way. The human wave tactics of the past would be relegated to a secondary role, behind a new focus. Tank spearheads with infantry reserves positioned to rush into the breaches. Coordination between all branches was improved, and massive amounts of artillery and even railroad guns were brought in to blast the Finnish defenses into dust. In the first 24 hours of the new offensive, over 300,000 shells were fired at the Mannerheim line. The shelling continued for days, with increasing intensity, destroying Finnish fortifications and stressing the garrisons to their limit. In spite of the damage it had suffered, the Mannerheim line was still formidable, but the Russians were just as willing as ever to spend ammunition and lives to break through it. The new Russian offensives were far more effective, inflicting considerable casualties on the Finns and creating many near breakthroughs. The pressure became so intense that on February 15th, the Finnish army fell back to their second line of defenses. This retreat made clear that the Finns were losing the war. The government decided it was time to make peace with the Russians. If that failed, they would beg the Swedes to join the war. And only if those attempts both failed, they would resort to the Allies' whack job plan. The Finns put out feelers to the Swedes to see how likely they would be to intervene but the Swedes shot the idea down immediately. They wanted the Finns to make peace now while they were still likely to keep their independence. That way, Finland would remain as a buffer between themselves and Russia. The Soviets laid out their preliminary demands to Finland on February 25th. When the Allies found out about this on the 29th, they responded with hysteria. The French government had staked all of its legitimacy on the Finland scheme. So in desperation, offered to send 50,000 troops and 100 bombers to Finland by the end of March if the Finns issued the call for help. 
but it was obvious to everyone that the French couldn't have delivered on this if they tried. The British, meanwhile, and only slightly less delusionally, considered landing troops in Norway without permission in the hopes that the Norwegians would just let them in. The Russians presented their final terms on March 8th. They included the cession of the entire Karelian Isthmus, the Rybaki Peninsula, and much of the Sala district. The island of Hanko would be leased for 25 years to build a military base, and Finland would have to sign a mutual assistance pact with the Soviets. The Soviets said that their terms were non-negotiable, but the Finns tried anyway. First, they argued that a more lenient peace would allow Finland and Russia to enjoy better relations in the future. And when that failed, they asked the Russians to at least pay for the land like Peter the Great had back in 1721. At that, Molotov snapped. Then write a letter to Peter the Great. If he orders it, then we'll pay compensation. Between that and throwing their lot in with the Allies, the Finns chose to sign the treaty on the 13th. Fifteen minutes before the scheduled ceasefire, the Soviets fired one last massive artillery barrage at the Finnish army. And with that, the Winter War had ended with the miraculous survival of Finland. Almost 25,000 Finns died in the fighting, while over 40,000 were wounded. Nearly every Finn living in the ceded territory chose to relocate into the remains of their country, displacing 12% of the nation's population. The Russians suffered much worse casualties, up to 270,000 dead and 300,000 wounded, all for 25,000 square miles of territory. As one Russian general put it, we've won just about enough ground to bury our dead. So leave a headstone emoji in the comments to help the Russians find the space to bury their dead. And please, comment generously. They're gonna need a lot of it. The new Finland that emerged from the Winter War was isolated and vulnerable. Its eastern border was practically indefensible, and the German conquests of Denmark and Norway put Finland into even deeper isolation than from before the war. In desperation, Finland and Sweden, the last two independent states in the region, considered forming an alliance or even political union with each other. But those plans were foiled by the Germans and Russians who wanted to keep Scandinavia divided and more easily influenced. This left Germany as Finland's only viable security partner against Russia. Finno-German cooperation began in September of 1940, with a treaty allowing German troops to pass through Finnish territory to reach parts of occupied Norway. In spite of Soviet protests, the relationship blossomed from there. The Germans would eventually key the Finns in to their plans to invade Russia, and promise to return lost territory or even to expand Finland if they participated. It was a tempting offer. If the Germans defeated the Soviet Union, which seemed likely, the Finns would have been foolish not to secure a share of the spoils. But the cost of defeat in an offensive war would be catastrophic. So, while the Finns agreed to participate, they did their best to position themselves as co-belligerents, and not as allies, and also made it their policy to never justify Russian security concerns by not attacking Leningrad from the north. All of this left Finland's war goals kind of vague. Their stated war aims were to recover lost territory from the Winter War, but there was also a clear interest in taking more than that, which was itself conditioned on the Germans doing all of the hard work first. This confused tangle of interests, which were never clearly communicated to the Germans, would cause serious problems for the coming war effort. Because, as the Germans were preparing to fight a total war of annihilation against the Soviets, the Finns were only preparing to fight a limited war for ambiguous objectives. Anti-Soviet sentiments in Finland were high, so the coming conflict would enjoy both popular and political support. The Finns began their mobilization in June and would eventually raise a remarkable 630,000 soldiers from its population of 4 million people. There was little proper planning between Finnish and German forces in the lead-up to the invasion. The main focus of discussion was on placing German troops on unimportant part of the Finnish front to free Finnish troops for more important missions, and so the Germans could attack strategic targets like the Murmansk Railroad and the city of Murmansk itself. 
When the German invasion began on June 22nd, the Finns declared neutrality. But the farce was revealed the next day when the Luftwaffe began operating from Finnish air bases. On the 25th, the Soviets launched counter raids into Finland, prompting the Finns to declare what they claimed to be a defensive war. The Finnish Army of 1941 was a far superior force to that of the Winter War back in 39. The new army was larger, more experienced, and thanks to the Germans, much better equipped. Large Soviet formations had been removed from the Finnish front to help cope with the main German invasion, so by the time the Finns began their offensive, they enjoyed local superiority of up to 4 to 1. The Finns had little difficulty advancing up to their lost territory and beyond. By the end of 1941, the Finns had achieved their objectives, but the Germans had not. They failed to take Murmansk, or cut the railroad leading to it. This would become a major problem, because that was one of the main inlets for Allied Lend-Lease. The broader German army didn't achieve its objectives either. Major cities like Leningrad, Stalingrad, and the capital in Moscow remained in Soviet hands. The Finns, content with their gains and weakened by their losses from the offensives, were unwilling to do much to help the Germans fix any of this. The Finns also became the target of diplomatic pressures from their former partners in Great Britain and the United States. The Finnish relationship with the Germans began to sour in July, when the Germans forced the Finns to break diplomatic relations with the United Kingdom. This prompted the British to bomb Pechanga, and join the Americans in intensifying their diplomatic pressures. The Americans even published a Russian peace offer to Finland to sow distrust between the Finns and the Germans. The scheme worked, causing the Germans to force the Finns into signing the anti comintern Pact, which was only possible because Germany was providing Finland with much of its food. The relations with the Allies fully broke down at the end of November, when the British sent an ultimatum to Finland demanding it cease military operations against the Soviet Union. Though interestingly, there was no demand for a withdrawal from Russia. Regardless, when the deadline passed without an answer, the British declared war on Finland. In August, the Germans tried again to take Leningrad, and asked the Finns to help by attacking from the north. In keeping with their policy of not justifying Russia's security concerns, the Finns refused. But, in keeping with their second policy of committing more to the war if the Germans seemed likely to win it, told the Germans that they would reconsider if they made good progress. Finnish complacency allowed the Soviets to relocate even more troops from the Finnish front. So now, with the Soviet forces opposite Finland weaker than ever before, the Germans tried again to convince the Finns to take advantage and attack Leningrad, an operation which, by this point, would have certainly succeeded. But the Finns remained recalcitrant. So in 1942, the Germans planned Operation Nordlicht, Northern Lights, to finally capture Leningrad and convince the Finns to commit to the war. But the Soviets beat them to the punch with their own offensive around Leningrad in August, doing enough damage to the German army to make Nordlicht impossible. The period from 1943 to the summer of 44 was remarkably quiet for Finland. Germany, however, had a very different experience. In that time, they were completely pushed out of Africa, lost army groups south at Stalingrad, and suffered Allied landings in Italy and later France. The Finns noticed all of this and became convinced that they were on the losing side of the war. They started to look for an exit. First, and rather naively, the Finns just tried asking for Germany's permission to leave the war. Not only was that refused, but it prompted the Germans to demand a written assurance from Finland that they would not negotiate a separate peace. The Finns relented when their Prime Minister stated in a speech that Finland would fight to the end rather than submit to the Soviet Union. The text of that speech was sent to the Germans with an explanation that it represented Finland's official attitude. In spite of that supposed assurance, secret talks were held between the Allies, Finns, and Russians. But they went nowhere, as the Finns kept finding Russia's terms too harsh. This convinced the Soviets that they had to knock the Finns to their senses, and to do it before the Allies were in a position to further influence the peace terms. So on June 10, 1944, after a massive buildup of troops and equipment along the Finnish front, the Soviets launched their 1944 Finnish offensive. 
Due to the massive buildup of forces, the Soviets outnumbered the Finns several times over, both in terms of equipment and manpower. They gained significant ground, even on the first day, and by the 20th, they took Vipuri. This was such a shock that the Finns started taking the negotiations seriously. So as the army fell back to interior lines of defenses, the Finnish government simultaneously reached out to Germany for military assistance and to the Soviet Union for peace. Even though the Germans were well aware of Finnish efforts to leave the war, they decided to commit huge resources to defending them anyway. This included air wings, military equipment, and whole army divisions. On June 23rd, the Soviets responded to Finnish peace offers with interest, but demanded, as a precondition, that the Finnish Prime Minister and President sign a document stating that they were ready to surrender. The Finns interpreted this as a demand for unconditional surrender, so refused. While that was going on, Mannerheim tried to reassure Germany. He sent a letter to Hitler thanking him for his aid, and stating that Finland was ready to pursue closer ties with Germany. While that was definitely a lie, the Germans took advantage by threatening to end all support unless the Finns signed a binding alliance. So with the Soviets demanding unconditional surrender on one side, and the Germans demanding an alliance on the other, the Finns chose the Germans. But the Finnish people and parliament were both vehemently opposed to closer ties with Germany, making the formal alliance impossible. Instead, the Finnish president, Riti, publicly broadcasted a statement of Finland's commitment to Germany. But, as president, he could not truly speak for the government. To make that distinction clear, Parliament voted to protest the arrangement. Eventually, the Finns managed to beat back the Soviet attacks and stabilize their front. But far to the south, the German army was being annihilated in Poland. The Finns were running out of time to make peace. So moving quickly, Reedy resigned on July 31st, freeing Finland from what little commitment it still had to Germany and Parliament passed a law unanimously making Mannerheim president without election. It was time to leave the war. The stabilizing of the Finnish front and catastrophes in the south forced Germany to relocate many of its Finnish forces back to the continent. With so many of their troops leaving Finland, Germany's only remaining leverage was their control over the country's food supply. But even that was gone when the Swedes agreed to feed Finland if it left the war. So in anticipation of likely fighting with the Germans, the Finns began to fortify positions vulnerable to German troops. On August 24th, 1944, another one of Germany's unhappy partners, Romania, announced an armistice with the Soviets. The Finns sued for peace on August 25th. The Soviet terms, which were approved by the Allies, arrived on the 29th. To begin, Finland had to immediately make a public announcement that they were ending their relations with Germany. And second, they had to demand a withdrawal of all German troops from Finland by September 15th any German troops still in the country would have to be disarmed and handed over to the Soviets as prisoners. Those were only the preliminary peace terms, though. The rest of the treaty remained a mystery. But, in spite of that, Parliament voted to accept the terms. After a ceasefire was established, which the Soviets violated for at least 24 hours, the final peace terms were laid out. They included a return to the 1940 borders, plus the surrender of the Pechanga region, taking away Finland's only access to the Arctic Sea. A 50-year lease on the Porkala Peninsula, putting the Soviets in artillery range of Helsinki, and war reparations which could be paid in kind with raw materials. The Finns were also given 10 weeks to reduce their armed forces to peacetime levels, and the Soviets would have the right to use Finnish ports, airfields, and merchant shipping until the end of their war with Germany. On September 19th, the Finns agreed to all terms. Even after the treaty was signed, Soviet troops continued to cross into Finland wherever they found German forces to attack and no Finnish forces to stop them. The Germans, meanwhile, desperately tried to maintain good relations with Finland to protect their forces as they fled the country. But much of that broke down when the Germans tried and failed to invade the strategic Finnish island of Sursauri. Not only were the Germans defeated by the Finns, but also the Soviet Air Force who assisted them. In Finland proper, 
Finnish and German forces had an informal agreement to limit their fighting during the withdrawal, but it broke down as the pursuit dragged on, and especially after the deadline for evacuation passed. On October 3rd, relations broke down completely, with the Germans announcing that they would fight the Finns without restraint. Nonetheless, the German withdrawal into Norway was completed on April 27th, concluding the second time in Finnish history that once allied German troops had to be forcibly ejected from the country. Which isn't a lot, but it is strange that it happened twice. That day, April 27th, would be Finnish Veterans Day ever since. And with that, Finland's part in the Second World War, also known as the Continuation War, was over. The conflict saw Finland suffer 52,000 killed, 7,300 missing, and 148,000 wounded. This included Finland's fighting with the Germans towards the end, which saw 800 dead and 4,000 wounded. According to Finland, the Soviet casualties on the Finnish front were 270,000 killed and 550,000 wounded. Finland's continued existence as an independent state is a testament to the will and tenacity of its people. As a nation of only a few million, she twice fought and survived war with Russia, a nation many times her size, population, and wealth. The man who led them through all of this, Mannerheim, explains the significance of this in his speech to the Finnish army at the end of the Winter War. Soldiers, I have fought on many battlefields, but never have I seen your like as warriors. After 16 weeks of bloody combat, with no rest by day or night, our army stands unconquered before an enemy whose strength has grown in spite of terrible losses. Our fate is hard, now that we are compelled to surrender to an alien race, land which for centuries we have cultivated with our labor and sweat. Yet we must put our shoulder to the wheel, in order that we may prepare, on the soil left to us, a home for those rendered homeless, and a better life for all. And, as before, we must be ready to defend our diminished homeland with the same resolution and with the same fire with which we defended our undivided homeland. We are proudly conscious of our historic duty, which we shall continue to fulfill. The defense of Western civilization, which has been our heritage for centuries. But we also know that we have paid, to the last penny, any debt we may have owed to the West. That an army so inferior in numbers and equipment should have inflicted such serious defeats on an overwhelmingly powerful enemy, and, while retreating, have over and over again repelled his attacks, is a thing for which it is hard to find a parallel in the history of war. But it is equally admirable that the Finnish people, face to face with an apparently hopeless situation, were able to resist giving in to despair, and instead to grow in devotion and greatness. Such a nation has earned the right to live. And that was Finland's Civil War, Winter War, and the Continuation War. This video was funded by Finnish ultranationalists as a part of their efforts to achieve a greater Finland, including G.S. Rogers, Josiah, Peter, and the Union of X, as well as by this video's sponsor, Hearts of Iron 4, Arms Against Tyranny, which is out right now. Picking up a copy is a great way to thank Paradox for supporting our channel. Links to Arms Against Tyranny and where you can support us directly are in the description. Like, comment, and subscribe for more. I'll see you in the next one.